Pamela, I wanna, I'm going to go ahead and mute your lines. Everybody else will be open for the duration, and I'm going to go ahead and connect you into the live call. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We're ready. Yes. morning. This meeting of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights comes to order at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on August 17, 2018. The meeting takes place at the Commission's headquarters located at 1331 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. I'm Chair Catherine Lehman. The commissioners who are present at this meeting in addition to me are Commissioner Degbele, Commissioner Harriet, Commissioner Narasaki, on the phone, if you could confirm that you are on the line when I say your name. I believe we have Vice Chair Timmons Goodson. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Kersnow? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Cladney? Commissioner Cladney, are you on the line? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Yaki? Aye. Thank you. Quorum of the commissioners is present. Is the court reporter present? Thank you. Is the staff director present? Present. Thank you. The meeting now comes to order. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for the business meeting? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Second. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Madam Chair, I have an amendment. Mr. Degley? I move to amend the agenda to add a discussion and vote on the federal sexual harassment concept paper for 2019. Thank you. Uh, we, can, we can take that up in the program planning discussion, uh, but good to know. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I move that uh, we amend the agenda to introduce an administrative instruction regarding recusal and abstention. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Are there any other amendments? There's no further amendments. Let's vote to approve the agenda as amended. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. We'll now hear over the phone from our Indiana Advisory Committee Chair, Diane Clements Boyd, on the committee's recently released advisory memorandum, Voting Rights in Indiana. Ms. Clements Boyd, you are welcome to speak for 10 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Again, my name is Diane Clements-Boyd, and I serve as chairperson of the Indiana Advisory Committee. 
To the chair, Catherine Lehman, and the commissioners, thank you all for this opportunity to highlight a few areas outlined in the memorandum on voting rights in Indiana. The Indiana Advisory Committee appreciates the opportunity to support the commission's 2018 statutory enforcement report and assessment of minority voting rights access in the United States. First, on behalf of the Indiana Advisory Committee, please allow me to express appreciation to those that provided written comments as well as enlightening testimony during the hearings and forums held in Indiana. Also allow me to acknowledge and thank David Massat, Melissa Winterowski, Carolyn Allen, and intern Christina Rosales for the support they extended to the Indiana Advisory Committee, which led to the Indiana Memorandum coming to fruition. So again, thank you all. So in an effort to obtain, obtain a relevant and comprehensive uh, inform information, the committee decided on a four-part process that included a web-based hearing on February 12th, a community forum in Evansville on February 17th, a public forum in Indianapolis on March 2nd, and a community forum in Gary on March 31st. The committee heard testimony from community members academics, legal professionals, government officials, party representatives, and community advocacy groups. As indicated in the report, the committee approached the project from a neutral posture. However, during the course of the testimony, the committee began to identify clear barriers to voting in Indiana that warrant the attention of this body. I want to focus first on three areas of the report. First, Indiana's voter ID law. Second, purging of voters. Third, legal challenges to voter disenfranchisement. And then end by discussing some of the recommendations based on the findings. Indiana's voter identification law was identified by several panelists as one of the contributing factors resulting in low voter turnout. As stated in the statutory enforcement report, Indiana was the first state to adopt a voter ID law that required voters to show an unexpired state-issued photo ID with their current name and address at the polls in order to vote. The testimony and research presented revealed that voter ID requirements may have a disproportionate impact on African American and Latino voters. The Government Accountability Office reported that imposing a strict voter ID law decreased turnout by as much as two to three percentage points and negatively affected African Americans than whites. While in 2008, the Supreme Court upheld the voter identification law in the case Crawford versus Marion County Election Board, many panelists questioned if the law was ever necessary. Moreover, there was testimony that the purported fail state, which is the ability to cast a provisional ballot, is problematic at best. The panelists described many shortcomings of provisional ballots that included poll workers that do not always adequately explain the process to voters. Consequently, the voters do not understand that they have to return with the proper identification for their vote to count. There was also testimony that the voter identification requirement deters voters from even attempting to vote. Panelists also testified that there seems to be no evidence of widespread voter fraud in Indiana to warrant the law and that the mandated government-issued voter identification was a pretext to dis disenfranchise voters. Specific testimonies provided instances in which elderly African-American voters were bur burdened most by the voter ID. I would like to transition now to talk a bit about the purging of votes or voters. It has been reported that close to 500,000 individuals have been purged in Indiana since 2014, representing 8% of the voting population. The Indiana Secretary of State's office reported, following the federal guidelines outlined in the National Voter Registration Act, also known as the Motor Voter Act, for maintaining the active voter participation list. Indiana utilizes the interstate voter registration cross-check database to determine if voters have moved to another state, therefore deemed voters as no longer eligible to vote. Cross-check has been reported as unreliable and the sources of many false hits for Latino, Asian, and African American voters. There was also testimony that questioned the need for robust voter maintenance list efforts 
considering Indiana's lackluster voter participation rates in which Indiana ranked 50th or last in the 2014 election year. It was reported that only 30% of Hoosiers cast ballots in 2014 and in 2016, 58% of Hoosiers voted, which put Indiana in 38th place. Many expressed that efforts should be taken to promote voting by making voting easier as to, opposed to removing voters from the roads, risking disenfranchising voters. The requirements of the NBR are such that, one, the state must first have an objective and reliable information that voters have changed residence, residence then leading to, two, which sending a notification if voters do not respond or the notice is returned undeliverable, the election office must wait two federal election cycles during which the voter has not voted or appears to have voted before removal of voters from the rolls. Several panelists took issue with and questioned if the Crosstrek program met the objective and reliable test of the NVRA. There have been several legal challenges to voter uh, disenfranchisement, indicating efforts to suppress the vote in Indiana. I'll start by discussing Senate Bill 442, which was passed by the Indiana legislature, which would have allowed immediate removal of voters if they appeared in the interstate voter registration cross-check database. As a result of that sled this legislation on August 7th, August 11th of 2017, the Indiana State Conference of the NAACP and the League of Women Voters of Indiana filed a lawsuit against the Indiana Election Division and the Indiana Secretary of State to prevent the unlawful removal of voters from the registration rolls. In June of this year, one month before the law would have been enacted, District Judge Tanya Walton Pratt ruled in that legal challenge that the legislation violates the National Voter Registration Act and threatens to disenfranchise eligible voters. Judge Pratt opined that while the defendants have a strong public interest in protecting the integrity of voter registration roads and the electoral process, they have other procedures in place that can protect the public interest that do not violate the NVRA. The second challenge involved um, a legal suit filed on May 2nd by the ACLU filed against the Marion County Election Board on behalf of Common Cause Indiana and the Greater Indianapolis branch of the NAACP, alleging that voters in Marion County, which was the largest population of African Americans in Indiana, has had unequal access to early voting, citing a violation of the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Indiana state law requires that each three-person election board unanimously approve satellite voting in each county. Marion County, which is the county with the largest African-American population in Indiana, had one member who continuously voted against opening an additional early voting location, even though the surrounding counties had a much lower ratio of early voting places to register voters. The lawsuit alleged that the lone early voting site in the downtown city county building was disenfranchising voters. However, in April of 2018, federal judge Sarah Evans Barker or ordered the Marion County Election Board to establish at least two early satellite voting precincts in time for the November general election. Since that time preliminary injunction, the parties agreed to a consent decree which provides for six satellite voting precincts. And it's also worth noting that the Attorney General has tried to intervene by filing a motion to amend the consent decree, but the courts have denied that motion. Ms. And Ms. Lastly, Boyd, thank you so much for the presentation. I want to make sure that we do have time for the commissioners to ask questions. I'm gonna, so I'm going to turn to that now, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Thank you so much. I, I want to open up for questions from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Asai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work and uh, I hope you took note that we did incorporate some of your recommendations into the Voting Rights Act report that the commission issued this week. Uh, so we very much appreciate the input from all of our SACs. Um, I was curious as to uh, the 
statement that there's a newly amended state law that allows immediate removal of voters without them receiving notification before they are labeled inactive if they appear in the cross check program, which uh, we, in our own report, felt was a very flawed program. So I'm wondering right. what the rationale was for that and if there's any action being taken on that. Well, yes, there was action and there was an injunction. Uh, the federal uh, judge put a halt to that. So um, that is not occurring in Indiana at this time. Oh, that's great. And then the second question I had was uh, the Marion County where you have a three-person election board and one who uh, which requires unanimous approval for satellite voting um, with mm -hmm. the largest African-American population. So how are the election board members? Are they appointed by the governor? Are they elected? How do they... I believe they're, they are appointed um, by each party has a representative uh, as well as the county clerk. Uh, and I believe there is an attorney that acts as an advisor. And so has there been any effort to address that problem in Marion County with that particular board member? Again, as a result of the lawsuit, uh, it did take uh, organizations filing suit uh, to halt that as well. Right, but the board member is still there? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think that they're appointed, so, um, you know, I would assume that maybe they are. I don't know. Okay, well, thank you. It's just troubling that you would have someone there on election board who would be uh, preventing access to the ballot for so many people. Thank you. Right, and I think that that was um, the opinion of our committee that uh, it should not require uh, a unanimous vote. Uh, and I think if someone mentioned that we wouldn't have a Voting Rights Act if it required a unanimous vote. So that is definitely a flaw, uh, I think, in the procedures and actually in state law. Thank you, Chair Clemens Boyd. I meant also to say that I, my understanding is that Commissioner Cladney is now on the phone. Commissioner Cladney, is that correct? Commissioner Cladney, are you, are you on the line? Yes, yes I am. It's just a matter of being able to uh, hit the button correctly. <laughs> Thanks very much. So, uh, Chair Clemens Boyd, when you made your presentation, you made your presentation to the full uh, commission. Just wanted to make sure you knew. Oh. Uh, also, and I'm sorry. I, I did. I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, leave anything out. So I did write down some notes. And um, and you have the report in front of you. In front of you, there was so much uh, that we gleaned from this testimony. And uh, we think that the report. There's a lot there. Uh, there's a lot to unpack. But I think the committee uh, is committed to making sure that voters in Indiana are not disenfranchised. We are going a step further and uh, possibly issuing some op-ed pieces uh, just in the event that there are voters that uh, have been purged as a result. of uh, We have some commissioners that think that it's bad policy. Others think that there was more nefarious intent. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we want to make sure that uh, voters uh, have the opportunity to register to vote uh, before the deadline, uh, which is approaching on October 9th. So we're working feverishly uh, to draft some op-ed pieces uh, that we'll uh, submit to the Indianapolis Star, and hopefully they'll be picked up throughout the state. Thank you. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, and, and I'm also very pleased to report to you that the Commission has uh, followed all of the recommendations in your advisory memorandum directed at the Commission. So thank you for uh, those recommendations and I'm uh, pleased that we can check those boxes already to date. I want to ask my fellow Commissioners if they are comfortable uh, with our citing the relevant pages of the Commission's report um, responsive to the recommendations at page 13 of this advisory memorandum uh, directed to the Indiana Secretary of State when we send our, uh, let our transmittal letter. The, the, uh, uh, there's a question from Commissioner Harriet uh, that she doesn't understand what I was asking. That the issue is uh, when we send our transmittal letter of this report, we uh, 
we can also attach the commission's report and one of the recommendations uh, from the Indiana uh, Advisory Committee is that uh, uh, we issue, the Commission issue, a recommendation to Indiana Secretary of State to suspend the use of the cross-check program until a more accurate method for identifying voters registered in multiple locations is identified. We could cite the relevant pages of the Commission's report on the cross-check program when we send the transmittal letter. Your microphone is off if you wanted to turn it on. But yes, I, I mean, simply take what we've already voted on, send that, uh, and attach it with a letter. Hearing no objection, I think we'll plan to do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the Indiana State Advisory Committee? Okay, hearing Sorry, none. we didn't get to all of the recommendations, Chair Lehman. I apologize. Uh, but just know that uh, the Indiana Advisory Committee is very committed and uh, we uh, hope to extend its work beyond this report. Well, we look very much forward to following that. And I thank you very much for your presentation today as well as Ma for your service in Madam the Madam Chair, Madam Chair Kersenegger, I did have one question. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Kersenegger. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this uh, information. Um, just had one question with respect to the voter ID. Did you or were you able to do any evidence that would explain why it is that elderly African-American voters were burdened more by the voter ID requirement than any other demographic group? Some of the testimony uh, did describe um, that there were instances where uh, they were uh, delivered by a midwife um, uh, and there was uh, a birth certificate or there was no birth certificate or in, in one case, I believe there was a birth certificate where the mother actually did put a different name on the birth certificate uh, than was on the social security information. So there was a conflict there. Uh, and uh, there were just uh, circumstances even where, um, you know, they didn't have the proper voter ID. They had, uh, the, the uh, testimony was he had a stack full of ID, but none of it was good enough uh, that, that they were able to accept it. It didn't have the government issued picture ID. So uh, for whatever reason, uh, the stories that were shared, the testimony that was shared involved elderly African-American people uh, that, you know, bore the brunt of that policy. Did the, state, did the state direct any barriers that you found to the acquisition of state ID for elderly African-American voters? Other than testimony? This was yeah, direct my, my, my understanding is that uh, the state provides free IDs if you don't have one. Yes, uh, that is that is accurate. The state does provide free ID, and uh, I think that, that that it's a matter of uh, you know possibly transportation can be a barrier for individuals uh, in some cases, or just. Um, the knowledge of that being available. Um, I think we assume that everyone knows that. Uh, and in some cases, I, I believe that they did not. My, I guess I'm curious as to why it is and that African Americans apparently don't know even this. The and even the requirements that uh, are necessary to get uh, the ID, the birth certificate, the supporting documentation, in these instances, I'm not saying that there were other people that don't have those same barriers. I'm just describing the testimony that we received. Thank you. Commissioner Osaki, I understand you have some more questions. No, I just wanted to add to uh, what our SAC chair noted that the problem with free IDs is that you require feeder documents that have, that are themselves uh, usually uh, charged for. Uh, so you still have to pay money in order to get those feeder documents. And if you're not born in that state, that makes it even more difficult to get those IDs from other states. And then finally, uh, uh, what has happened with, I think, the elderly, uh, low-income uh, communities and voters is that 
they may have midwives or like my grandmother, uh, she lived in a very rural area and her birth wasn't recorded until two months after her actual birth. So there are a lot of problems that come up, uh, particularly in those days when less people were born in hospitals and you had less access to the kinds of very limited official documents that are required for these extremely strict IDs. And as the sector noted, Indiana is notorious for having among the strictest. So we have Commissioner Claddy, go ahead. I'd just like to note that uh, I actually went looking for my birth certificate two years ago and I couldn't find it. Uh, imagine that after 68 years. And uh, uh, I wound up having to uh, find, go back to the state that I was born in and I had to spend $25 to get it, the certified copy, because you need a certified copy. So I'd just like to note that for the record. Thank you. So Chair Clements Boyd, thank you again for your testimony today and for your leadership on your State Advisory Committee. We very much appreciate it. And Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. And next we'll hear from our Texas Advisory Committee Chair, Mimi Marziani, on the committee's recently released advisory memorandum, Voting Rights in Texas. I will I will say, Ms. Marziani, that uh, we are sorry that we don't see you here in person today, and we understand the travel <laughs> delays can, can cause it, but we're very grateful that yes. you're uh, willing to participate by phone. Please go ahead for 10 minutes. Oh. Of course. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Mimi Marziani, and I really do thank you for inviting me to testify this morning and for your flexibility with my disrupted travel plans. Uh, I have been really grateful for the honor of leading the Texas State Advisory Committee. As some of you know, I also serve as the president of the Texas Civil Rights Project. At TCRP, we provide Texas lawyers for Texas communities in service of a larger movement for equality and justice. And one of our main priorities is advancing and protecting voting rights, especially for persons of color. So I, I wanted to express that we are deeply appreciative of the Commission's work in this area. So the research of the Texas State Advisory Committee dovetails with that of the Commission to underscore some central truths about the state of democracy in Texas. Number one, Texas is a non-voting state, and that's true whether you measure it by voter registration rates, by turnout rates, or other indicators of civic engagement. Number two, one major reason that Texans do not vote is because we are not on the registration rolls. Even more disturbing is evidence uh, shown by our testimony of significant disparities between who are on the rolls and who is not. And these are driven by policy choices of our state. And in short, as we explain, Texas's current electorate, meaning those people who could cast a ballot that counts tomorrow, is much whiter and older than our population as a whole. Third, the mechanisms of our elections in Texas are deeply flawed. This leads to a chaotic experience during the voting period itself. And in our report, we highlight specific breakdowns in election administration, including, but not limited to, ever-changing polling places, election workers who don't understand election law and are sometimes influenced by bias, significant variations in policy between counties, improper partisan influence in local policy decisions, and a chronic failure to abide with federal law, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the language access provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And unfortunately, testimony indicated that all of these election administration problems disparately impact voters of color, voters with disabilities, and young voters. These problems are solvable, and they're solvable right here in Texas by state leaders. In our report on pages 13 and 14, we list dozens of specific policy changes that our state leaders could adopt, both in the Secretary of State's office and in the legislature. Uh, I would like to stress that these policy recommendations are directly driven by the testimony we received and we believe reflect common sense. And I'm really proud to say that our committee is made up of um, people who bring a variety of experience and partisan viewpoints to the table. And our entire committee believed 
that these recommendations should be embraced by state leaders regardless of political party. And I, I know you've read it, but I wanted, I wanted to quickly highlight just a couple of those examples. They include modernizing the voter registration process by com- complying with the National Voter Registration Act at state agencies and by adopting online voter registration. They include enforcing compliance with a longstanding state law that requires Texas high schools to provide voter registration to eligible students twice a year. We included reforming the legally problematic restrictions on voter registration drives, which currently make voter registration drive activity wrought with legal liability. And finally, investing in polling place administration by creating statewide standards, training, and providing resources to the counties to implement this. And uh, we, we argue that we can and should take a cue from the private sector and approach voting with a customer-first attitude. In closing, I'll note that very unfortunately, and despite the diligence of our committee that is laid out on the first page of our report, no statewide leader would participate in our public hearing in person. We did extensive outreach to state leaders urging their participation, including the Secretary of State's office, the election division, the attorney general, and lawmakers who have recently sponsored significant election law legislation in Texas, such as the photo ID law. And we did ultimately receive short written testimony from the Secretary of State's office, which we uh, incorporated. And so even though we were disappointed there, We do very much hope that this commission will decide to send our report and recommendations to those state leaders and urge them to take seriously our common sense suggestions to reform elections in Texas and better protect voting rights. Um, Thank you for your time, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Chair Marziani. I'll open up for uh, questions from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Degway. Sure. Um, Thank you so much for this important study of voting in Texas. It was helpful to have, and I think that there are many of the themes and issues that you uh, discuss that are overlapping with the larger narrative of the report that this commission released this week. Um, In particular, I want to explore with you the observation that the Texas election code is now the the only or at least the principal law governing polling place changes in Texas (laughs) and that it requires just 72 hours notice of polling location changes and that in recent elections, last minute changes have greatly increased confusion on where voters are required to vote. The, the, The reason I focus on this item as as you have focused on it is that there there is a sense that there are some measures or issues that are soundly um, in the discretion of local election officials and should not be the subject of greater oversight Um, uh, some may argue that that was part of the rationale for the shelby county ruling but uh, i think Mm -hmm. i think the national report points out that that these changes that may be seemingly small, changing a polling place or moving it from from one place to another, can actually affect a, a disenfranchisement of voters if it is carried out in the way that you describe in this report, a, a hide the polling Absolutely. place um, approach to uh, making polling place modifications. And so I'm just interested in any um, depth or, or additional um, sight lines you could give us into how this is playing out in Texas. And I note that this issue is playing out in many other states with hotly contested elections. Absolutely. Thank you for that observation. Um, I think there are three points in response that could be helpful for the commission. Uh, number one, to your point of local discretion, Of course, the Texas Election Code actually already sets a floor in this area. It does set a 72-hour notice period. Um, Our committee certainly thinks that's not enough. Testimony uh, indicated strongly that 72 hours is is not enough notice. But um, it does mean that this would not be a new regulation into local matters. Instead, this would be the state adjusting that time period 
to reflect the reality from the ground. Um, second point is that uh, the testimony indicated and common sense also supports that the folks who are um, really impacted uh, most significantly by last minute polling place changes uh, tend to be poor. They lack uh, private cars. Um, they are more likely to have hourly jobs where there's a, a, a significant economic burden in taking time off to vote. And in Texas, unfortunately, because of other uh, information we received, we also know, including the, the photo ID law that and litigation that uh, the commission explored in depth in your report, we know that there is a strong correlation in Texas between being poor and being more likely to be a person of color. And so this absolutely has racial effects. The third point I'll make to you and something else we highlight in our report is that um, right now the Secretary of State's office does not um, uh, collect and analyze provisional voting data. And because of that, there's no official source for us to understand just how burdensome polling place changes are. Um, that, that would obviously only give you one indication, but it's an important indication because if somebody shows up to vote at the wrong polling place in, in Texas, they're giving a provisional ballot and that will ultimately not be counted. But there is a record of the provisional ballot Right now, those records are only kept at the county level, and the state has not gone through what we think would be the very important step of looking statewide at um, how many people ballots are, are, quite frankly, thrown in the trash can because they end up just going to the wrong polling place and then trying to connect that with polling place changes. Thank you. Commissioner Rasaki. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work. I think Texas is one of the foremost examples that the, at least I had in mind uh, when I agreed with the finding in our recent report that some states persistently fail to comply with uh, various voting rights laws. And Texas has been challenged, uh, I think, maybe competing with North Carolina for the state most sued uh, by civil <laughs> yeah. rights groups. Uh, for the many violations uh, that they uh, continue to resist wanting to allow the minorities who live in their state to vote. I note that Texas has uh, one in 11 Americans live in Texas. So what happens to voters in Texas has an enormous impact on our country. And that almost 20% of the Latino population calls Texas their home, second only to California. So the work that your SAC is doing, I think has import not just for Texas, but for the entire country. So very much appreciate uh, the very thoughtful uh, examination and recommendation and am impressed that it was unanimously found uh, by your uh, state committee, which is very, very bipartisan. I was very struck with the very tough uh, limitations on the people who are allowed to help register Texas voters, uh, particularly given the low amount of turnout in Texas, one would think that the state leadership would be more concerned about trying to help their uh, citizens get to the ballot box instead of throwing barriers in front of people who are volunteering uh, many times to register. And I'm wondering uh, what the debate was in terms of uh, what, what was behind all of these very severe uh, restrictions like criminal penalties uh, associated with failure to comply and uh, all of those issues and uh, what the thinking is in terms of how those could be fixed. Absolutely, and, and thank you for um, all of those insightful thoughts. Um, yes, by my calculation, uh, the rules in Texas governing voter registration drives are more strict than anywhere else in the country. And the results are stark. One of the findings that we included, for instance, that Bear County, which is home to San Antonio, one of the largest, fastest growing 
most diverse cities in the entire country, has a population right now of more than 1.5 million people. And in 2016, there were less than 1,000 people who could legally register their neighbor to vote. Now, that, that is a pretty shocking statistic. Um, the story of how we got to this point is fairly complicated, and I, I don't have time to share it all today, but I'll note a couple things. One, um, it was the product uh, of, one, laws that were actually fairly progressive in the 1980s going stale over time. And then number two, in 2011, some tightening of these laws by the state legislature. And, and quite frankly, that tightening was overshadowed by the uh, photo ID law and by the redistricting maps that were passed at the during that same legislative session, both of which have been held by multiple federal courts to discriminate in one way or another against black and brown voters in Texas. And so I, I do think that's one of the reasons that these voter registration drive restrictions have flown relatively under the public radar. Uh, I will point to footnote 34 of of our report and uh, excuse me for um, I, I do not mean for this to be a self promotion but this is a subject that I particularly know a lot about and I um, did publish a report with the American Constitution Society this summer talking about restrictions on voter registration drives and if you're interested in diving a little bit more deeply into the history it is all laid out in in that article cited in footnote 34. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good for any other questions from fellow commissioners, including on the phone? Okay. If there's no further questions, we'll move to our next item on our agenda. And thank you, Chair Marziani, for your service and your leadership on the Texas State Advisory Committee and for taking the time to speak with us today about this really terrific report. Thank you. Next, we'll hear thank from... You. Our Alabama Advisory Committee Chair, Jenny Carroll, on the committee's recently released summary of testimony titled Access to Voting in Alabama. I will say that I had the pleasure of attending the State Advisory Committee uh, meeting in Alabama. And uh, Chair Carroll, you have shown up me as a chair and set a new bar for other chairs by baking homemade cupcakes and bringing them to the State Advisory Committee meeting. So thank you for that. It was especially lovely. And I'm sorry that I didn't do that today. Pick it up, <laughs> Layman. Pick, pick up the pace, Layman. <laughs> <laughs> You're not making it better, <laughs> but you go ahead with the 10 minutes now. <laughs> I'm not sure your microphone is on. Press the red button, the button yeah. Sure. Um, am I on now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to skip some of the thank yous, which is not to say I'm not grateful, but I want to get to some of the substance of what I prepared for today. Um, on February 22nd, the Alabama State Advisory Committee did hold a hearing in Montgomery um, to explore the topic of voting regulation in our state following the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County um, versus Holder. Um, at that hearing, we heard testimony that since the Shelby County decision, Alabama has passed a number uh, and implemented a number of facially neutral regulations on voting that nonetheless raise some concerns about the opportunity of enfranchisement among the very populations that the Voting Rights Act was designed to protect. Um, the days of the sheriff standing in the doorway of the polling place in Louds County may be a thing of the past in Alabama, but nonetheless, concerns consist, uh, persist rather that voting requirements um, may produce the same effect on poor and minority populations of our state. The methods may be softer, they may be more subtle, um, but the results of these post-Shelby County regulations um, are much the same. Now, I want to focus my comments today on a few of the regulations we explored, voter ID requirements, voter purging policies, and felon reenfranchisement procedures. There's others we could talk about. We could talk about the lack of early voting in the state of Alabama, limited absentee balloting procedures, the location of polling places coupled with a lack of public transportation in many counties, confusion around electoral requirements and procedures. The list goes on and on, um, but I have 10 minutes, and the history and 
complexity of current voting regulations is long. So I'm going to keep my focus on these, though I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have um, with regard to others. So one of the first regulations that Alabama passed following the Shelby County decision was the requirement that voters have identification. Secretary of State John Merrill and John Park testified that ID requirements reduce individualized voter fraud by ensuring that the person who casts the ballot is actually the person listed on the voting rolls. Now, Alabama does accept a variety of identifications. Secretary of State John Merrill, however, acknowledged in testimony that the most common form of voter identification accepted by the state is an ID card that is issued through the Department of Motor Vehicles, the county clerk's office, or in some cases by the Secretary of State's mobile ID unit. Now, I applaud the efforts of my state to ensure voter integrity, and I also applaud their efforts to accept multiple forms of ID and offer multiple locations at by which to obtain those forms of ID. The problem is that does not tell the whole story, and I'm a person who likes whole stories. So on behalf of the committee, I did a little research and dug into some more information about identifications in the state of Alabama. In 2015, in response to a uh, budget dispute at the state level, then Governor Bentley decided to close 31 DMV offices throughout the state of Alabama. In 2016, the Department of Transportation conducted an investigation into these closures and concluded that the closures adversely affected counties with majority black populations. Now, this led me to dig into the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency, or ALEA, statistics, as well as census data for the state. Of the 11 counties in Alabama that have a majority or near majority black population, eight suffered complete closures of DMV offices in their counties. The three counties that did not suffer such closures are home to Montgomery, Birmingham, and Selma, which is the state capital and two of the most populous cities in our state. In response to the DOT's findings, the state reopened offices in some of the counties, though with limited hours. For example, when I contacted Wilcox County, I learned that the office was open three days a week. In Bullocks County, it's only open one day a week. I also pulled the ALEA statistics for the 31 closed locations. In 2014, prior to the closures of these DMV offices, they issued 3,149 driver's license and over 5,000 learner permits. Under the new reduced hours, these offices issued less than 1,000 in 2016 and 2017. Counties such as Choctaw, Sumter, Hale, Green, Perry, Wilcox, Louds, Butler, Crenshaw, Macon, and Bullocks are all poor counties. They're among some of the poorest counties in our nation. They're primarily black. Some have populations as high as 82 percent African American, and all of them lack a full-time DMV office. Now, as for clerk's offices, they tend to be in town centers. They suffer similar limited hours, as we heard in the testimony from uh, Secretary of State Merrill, and public transportation is virtually, and in some cases, actually non-existent in these counties. Now, in the end, the budget figures available on AL.gov, which is our government budget source, show that the closures of these DMV offices saved our state $200,000 to $300,000 out of a general budget that year that was over $100 million. So no sheriff had to stand in the polling place door to disenfranchise these populations in these counties. The real lived experience of the poor and rural and working class people in those counties in my state was that acquiring an ID as required by the state identification law to vote poses a significant logistical challenge. That it is possible to acquire the ID does not mitigate that challenge. And so with all due respect to Secretary of State Merrill, who indicated that anyone who wants to get an ID need only try, he even offered his cell phone number to us at the hearing, and we were told we could call him directly. All the efforts in the world by those individuals are not going to reopen those DMV offices. They're not going to create transportation systems that can get people to county clerk's offices. And I can tell you from firsthand experience stuck on the side of the road in Greene County, where I had absolutely no cell service, they are not going to create the ability to contact the Secretary of State. Now weigh that against voter integrity concerns raised by the Secretary of State. 
the Secretary of State Merrill acknowledged that prior to the voter ID law's passage, there were no reported or investigated instances by his office of voter impersonation. According to Merrill, since he took office, which is after the voter ID law was passed, there have been six incidences. Now, this is consistent with uh, testimony by Professor Justin Levitt before North Carolina that in 14 years, there were 31 credible cases of voter fraud by impersonation out of over a billion ballots cast. And by the testimony of Director, Director Kareem Creighton before us, that such type of fraud is simply infinitesimal. Plainly put, it's a poor way to steal an election. So I want to turn to the issue of voter purges. Now, like all states, voters in Alabama are required to register to vote. Now, in many ways, Alabama has done a good job of streamlining this process. We offer multiple ways to register and multiple methods of registration, including an online method of registration. But staying registered to vote is another story in the state of Alabama. Inactive voter policies may negate some of the advances that we've seen in efforts to increase the amount of voter registration. In Alabama, voters are declared inactive if the Board of Registrars are unable to confirm the voter's address. Now, on its face, that seems logical and well-connected to goals of voter integrity. Such confirmation of address, however, requires that the voter mail in cards. Now, this method assumes that a voter receives mail and is, over and is able to return the card within a designated period of time. If the voter cannot or does not, he or she is removed from the eligible voter list and must complete a voter re-identification update either in person or through the mail. So for many voters, we heard testimony that the first time they learned that they were listed as inactive voters was when they actually showed up to cast their ballot. At that point, they're faced with three options. They can vote a provisional ballot um, and then provide the required update on voter ID by 5 p.m. the Friday following the election. They can fill out the update form at the polling place. And for many polling places, this requires them to stand first in line to fill out the form and then stand in another line to cast the ballot where they cannot vote at all. So the result is elevant, el evident. rather. Even eligible voters may find themselves faced with an untenable choice between expending time that they simply do not have or losing their right to vote. This brings me to the last topic, felon disenfranchisement. There's two components to this. The process required for reenfranchisement through the Board of Pardons and Paroles and the requirement that a voter have paid off all court fines, legal fees, and victim restitution before they may seek reenfranchisement. In 2017, Alabama amended its statutes so that only designated crimes of moral turpitude produce disenfranchisement. While the list of these offenses are widely available, admittedly an improvement over the county-by-county county determination that occurred prior to 2017, testimony shows that still 7.62% of voters in Alabama are disenfranchised. In addition, the testimony showed that there was widespread confusion about requirements for voter reenfranchisement, including confusion about whether or not fines and fees actually had to be paid before folks could re-register to vote. Beyond this, the crimes of moral turpitude list in Alabama focuses primarily on street level offenses. As a former public defender, I will tell you those are the types of offenses that minority and poor people tend to get arrested for, charged with, and convicted of. As a result, this neutral classification may be loaded with bias. I realize I'm at the end of my time, but I want to offer this summary. I've tried to provide you with a snapshot of regulation in Alabama, and I want to be clear, the picture I'm providing you concerns me not because I think it rises to the level of disenfranchisement we saw historically in our state, nor because I believe that these regulations necessary car necessarily carry within their body an intent to discriminate. I am concerned about these regulations because I believe, regardless of that intent, that they may be having the same effect. Simply put, the road to the ballot box is longer and harder for poor and minority populations in my state. So the same men and women who have the least in my state are losing one more right, which is the right to vote and hold their government accountable to them. Now, when I'm here before you, 
I don't think in terms of broad electoral theories. I don't think in terms of a spectral concept of fraud. I think in terms of the men and women I have met and spoke with within my state. I think of their lives, I think of their experiences, and I think their voices should matter to our government. So whatever progress we have made, I believe we can do better by them. So thank you, and I'm happy to entertain questions. And I'm sorry I ran over. Thanks very much, Chair Carroll. I'll open for questions from my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Douglas? Uh, Madam Chair? Madam Vice Chair, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I uh, um, thank uh, Chair uh, Carroll for an uh, excellent presentation and for all of the work done in connection um, with this issue. I was particularly uh, touched by the uh, information provided that indeed uh, an effort was made in 2017 um, through legislation to try and to uh, do something about a felt-need disenfranchisement. Uh, it sounds as if um, there was some made, but certainly not enough. Uh, some years ago, I was secretary with Merrill and was sharing with him the fact that um, where felony disenfranchisement is concerned, North Carolina was very progressive uh, in that uh, once an individual um, was freed from parole and had completed all obstructions in connection with felony, they were automatically. Madam Vice Chair, I'm sorry for uh, interrupting you. I, we, we appreciate that you're that you're ca calling in from a Category Two storm in your state, uh, but but we are having some interference with uh, hearing you. Is it is it possible for you to move or to uh, move closer to the microphone so that we can hear you more clearly? Um, I'm right on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now we uh, hear you better. That, I don't think we're. Um, but uh, to get to um, the chair. My question is, um, he appeared to express some interest in um, the return of one uh, franchisement uh, by felon, the automatic. And um, can you tell me whether the current statute uh, allows for that? So as I understand it, your question is whether or not the current statute in Alabama allows for automatic reenfranchisement of uh, those convicted of crimes that fall outside of the prohibited categories. Um, the answer is no, that in order to um, be reenfranchised under the state statute, you have to go through the board of pardon and paroles. You have to apply for and receive a certificate of eligibility to vote, no as a serve. Um, part of the problem in the state is that there is one wide discrepancy on what qualifies as having satisfied the requirements for the serve. Um, and one of the primary issues of dispute county by county is whether or not the payment of all fines and fees qualify. Secretary of State Merrill has issued a statement in response to a question we sent him regarding that issue um, that you do not have to have paid all fees and fines to be eligible. However, um, according to various offices, they are still requiring that individuals have completed um, those financial obligations before they will issue the serve. Beyond that, access to the actual form um, to apply for serve is not widely available, nor is it routinely distributed to individuals at either the time of sentencing, um, during the period of incarceration, um, during the period of release, or necessarily by a probation or parole officer um, as he or she advises the individual. Um, it's, it's really inconsistent throughout the state and that's one of the big concerns that our committee has identified thank you thank you and good luck with the hurricane commissioner Dagway. thank you um, thanks for that very compelling um, testimony and articulation of the SACS work in Alabama um, my, my uh, 
I have more of a statement than a question, though I, I think there will be a, a small question in here. Your, your recitation of the findings of the SAC are in many ways the, the perfect example of what has been lost in a post-Shelby world. I say that because you took it upon yourself to drill down into the facts that will illuminate what the impact of certain changes are that affect voting, which was in effect what the preclearance regime allowed and required before voting changes could, could go in place. They, they, it required that the information be visible and be proffered so that the real world impact, as you said, could be known. And what that did is it created an opportunity to mitigate problems before a measure was put in place. And so I, I think that your testimony from the state that brought us Shelby County, from the state that in some respects brought us the Voting Rights Act, and you've specifically mentioned Selma, which continues apparently to be part of this national story. Um, but you have articulated in a very clear way what the challenges are for voters who no longer have important protections uh, that once guarded their voting rights, not for some special reason, because they had, for many years, had impediments put in their way. And I'm sad to hear that that story continues, though perhaps it was something that we anticipated um, in the wake of Shelby County. More specifically, there was testimony from the chair of, or from Mr. Simulton of the NAACP about voters who voted in a very recent election last year who were nonetheless gone from the rolls, purged, I guess, um, from the rolls when they showed up to vote. Is there any visibility about how that could happen? It's not clear to me that that would be consistent with any um, NVRA permitted purging process. Right. And my understanding, and I mean, this has been something that I have been working on trying to track down, um, and I'm not done. Um, because I tend not to be done until I figure it out. Um, that, but, that seems apparent. <laughs> yeah, you can talk to my mother about the long history of that. But um, <laughs> the um, what I am finding is that in many of the precincts that I am being directed to by various organizations, including the NAACP, the um, folks at LDF, um, ACLU, is that many of these voters were not completely off the list. They were listed as ineligible. And so that's that process I discussed where they're making a choice then of do I stand in line and fill out this eligibility form or mail the eligibility form in or go to the clerk's office, fill out the eligibility form, or do I simply walk away? Um, it becomes especially problematic because at least in some of the precincts that I looked into um, that I was directed to by these organizations, um, they were some of the precincts that had the longest polling lines at hours we would expect in the early morning before folks go to work and in the evening when folks come home from work and are trying to cast their ballot. So that's one problem. Um, the other thing I'm seeing is there were some polling place location changes, um, something I didn't talk about in my comments, um, that produced um, changes in where folks had voted. So people might have voted for their entire voting history at one location, and as a result of a polling place change, they were now asked to vote somewhere else. And again, this highlights the problem with inconsistent information about what the appropriate response is. At some precincts, voters were directed to go to an alternative voting location where they were actually supposed to vote. So they weren't on the rolls at that particular precinct, but they were on the rolls in another precinct. Um, at other locations, though, no such information was provided, and voters were instructed that they could cast a provisional ballot because they were not included on the rolls. What the voters weren't always told at those precincts I'm finding, or I'm finding inconsistent information about it is that if they cast the provisional ballot at the incorrect precinct, the provisional ballot is not counted. So those folks are effectively disenfranchised, not because they're making a conscious choice, but because they lack good information. And again, I don't need malicious animus or discriminatory animus to see that that has, as you said, a real world impact on 
and folks. Um, and I do live in the real world. I live in the state. I live among the men and women who are suffering the consequences of this, who are frustrated by it, who talk in terms of, I'm ready to give up. I don't think it matters if I register to vote. I don't think it matters if I show up to vote because there is always going to be one more impediment placed in front of me. And I think that's a real shame. And I think that's something that um, Secretary of State Merrill is well aware of. And again, I do mean to give him credit for what he has tried to do in our state. I appreciate what he has tried to do. What I'm trying to say, and I think this is what we heard in the testimony um, following Secretary of State Merrill in our hearing, is that those good intentions are also not sufficient if in the real world those good intentions don't solve the fundamental impediments that we're seeing put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Arasaki. Thank you. I love your passion. <laughs> um, I was very struck by the discussion in the voter turnout uh, and the testimony by uh, the Alabama ACLU uh, that he shared. Uh, about the fact that you had uh, people at the polling places who were incorrectly telling voters they were not allowed to vote a regular ballot because their address didn't match the ID when that in fact is not the law. Uh, and I want to understand, it seemed to be coming from a probate judge. So what is the role of a probate judge in elections? Well, thank you for that question. Um, and before I answer it directly, I want to also let you all know that we are actually having a meeting next week in which we are deciding which probate judges we want to speak to, because that became apparent that that was a big gap in the testimony that we had received at our hearing in February, that while the Secretary of State promulgates the statewide policies, it's the probate judges who are the boots on the ground who are making decisions when an issue arises in a particular precinct. So two things happen. One thing that happens is the precinct chair has to make a decision and I have with me the Alabama election ha uh, handbook uh -huh. which Secretary of State Merrill kindly shared with me and I have now read and complete. Um, that indicates the precinct chair makes the initial decision about whether or not a voter should cast a provisional ballot. If there are questions or if the voter contests the decision by the precinct chair, it's the probate judge within the county. It's usually the chief probate judge who makes a decision about how whatever irregularity or question should be resolved. So one of the big topics that came up at our hearing was the probate judges are receiving inconsistent information. They're often not attending the training sessions offered by the Secretary of State that inform them of what's in this book. Um, Secretary of State Merrill, since our hearing, has actually posted on his website um, a summary, an 11-page summary, that are the nuts and bolts of what voting regulations and rules are. So again, I'm grateful for him to do that. Um, however, I would like to see some more consistent training for the probate judges. And I I think one of the things our committee has discussed as we've started to work on our report is that we have this concern that probate judges just aren't getting the information they need to make those good decisions. Um, so I haven't spoken to the probate judges yet. I can't tell you exactly what happened in those particular cases, but that is what's coming next for us. I was wondering because I, I think in some states that uh, where the Secretary of State is in charge of enforcing the state law that uh, there are election protection efforts, right? And so attorneys, mm -hmm. when something like this happens, will often call the Secretary of State and ask the Secretary of State to please instruct the person at that local place what the correct law is. Is that, there's no system of that in? I mean, you could. I mean, that is one possibility, but the routine you know, chain of command is to go to the probate judge from the probate judge and then to go to someone in the Secretary of State's office. Um, there are also election commissioners in between. Um, an election commissioner could feel the response. Um, you know, I told the story at our hearing that the first time I voted in Alabama, um, I showed up. I had sent in my voter registration card. I thought I was registered to vote. I showed up. I wasn't on the roll. So I was told that I had to cast a provisional ballot. I had actually taken a photograph of my voter registration card before I sent it in because I'm a lawyer, that's what I do. <laughs> and I showed it to the individual and, and assured him I had mailed it, who was my precinct captain. Um, we contacted the election commissioner in Jefferson County, who was actually extremely helpful. Um, and I did have to cast a provisional ballot, but he contacted me the next day to tell me that I had been confirmed as properly voting in the correct precinct and that my provisional ballot would be cast. Now. 
I think I'm a little unusual and that I react that way. Um, my husband <laughs> was mortified. My children are mortified every time I tell this story. Um, but it does suggest to me that if you're pushy enough, you can get the correct outcome. I just don't want to have to depend on every individual to be quite so pushy. I'm also voting in an off time. I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm a professor. I can go and vote at 10 a.m. and beat the crowd um, where there's nobody else at the precinct. And I can get right through to the election commissioner. Not everyone can do that, I recognize. Yeah. So that's what we're really trying to do in, in, in well, making our recommendations. It, it also sounds like probate judges are elected, so there might be other ways of correcting problems. Um, so. The second thing I want to ask is uh, Mr. Boone also testified that in some places there was actually police intimidation and it wasn't clear to me whether that was also in Mobile County or more widespread than that? So there were um, media reports as well as Twitter accounts of police intimidation. I have had tried to track some of those down with limited success. Um, I was I was not able to speak to anyone in Mobile County. I did speak to sheriff's departments in Jefferson County and Shelby County, which are two high population counties in Alabama. Um, in both of those instances, I was told that there were sheriff offices present, officers present to keep the line orderly and to make sure people weren't stepping in and out of line. Alabama requires you to be in line at the time the polling place closes in order to cast a ballot. Um, so the indication I got is that's why sheriff officers were present. Um, I was told um, by one sheriff's office, and I apologize, I can't remember which county it was in, if it was Shelby or Jefferson County, that there was a sheriff who recognized one individual who who had a warrant in the line and informed the individual of the warrant, though the office informed me they did not remove the individual from the line. Um, so the individual was able to vote, but was informed that they did have an outstanding warrant and would be taken into custody afterwards. That would be a distinct um, deterrent to wanting to go to vote, I would assume. <laughs> well, and I would think that if I was further down in the line and perhaps had similar concerns, I might suddenly find myself needed elsewhere as well. So that was my other fear, right? It's not only deterring people who right. have warned who are being talked to by the sheriff's office, but if you're further down the line and you're worried, you're stepping out of line. Um, yeah, well, and we also have an extraordinary time right now where the relationship with police and communities is not often a healthy one. So that is a problem. I so. agree. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Um, there is other, actually one other thing I would like to say, and it was in response. Um, I actually looked up some data in response, and I apologize, I don't know the commissioner's name who asked the question about um, free IDs. And I do want to emphasize Alabama does offer free identification, but we did hear testimony consistent with what we heard from the chair in Indiana, that the impediment around the ID often comes in the form of folks who either don't have birth certificates, who are paying fees. The testimony we heard was it was fees up to $100 to get a certified copy of the birth certificate get in our state, um, which means that the free ID is actually not free. Um, it, it's a significant incursion on, on familial um, budgets. And I can remember a time in my own life when $100 would have made the difference um, between me having basic things that I needed and me not having those basic things. So I would not have gotten my ID if that had been the case. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. I lost my ID once. I actually had to fly back to my state because I had to personally present myself and, and sign an affidavit in order to get it. So not only was it the fee, but I had to actually pay to fly back to get it. You know, to page 24 of your summary of, of uh, evidence, you also include information about people having to um, travel to replace a photo ID and, and the cost of up to $100 as well. So thank right. you for thank you. Uh, Some commissioners who are here today may have some sympathy for having had to travel in, in a similar way to be able to vote. I'll leave it there for that. <laughs> uh, I, I thank you very much for your testimony today. I noticed that um, your the uh, paper that we received is a summary of the testimony received in, uh, from the Alabama State Advisory Committee. And it, it sounds from your testimony like there is much more work ongoing still uh, among the State Advisory Committee members. And so I look forward to what will be your ultimate report. But I very much appreciate the committees having taken the time to prepare what is, a, it seems to me, a very disciplined summary of testimony that uh, ranged perspectives that the committee received. Uh, it's consistent with what I heard when I was there, so it's also uh, nice for me to be able to read. And uh, in particular, I appreciate what you say at page eight of the summary, that uh, you are providing a boots on the ground view of the current status of access to voting in the state of Alabama. So thanks very much to you and to your fellow committee members for preparing that summary and for the ongoing work that you do. 
Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Before we turn to the next item on our agenda, I just want to note that we also have here present the chair of the New Mexico State Advisory Committee, uh, Chair Sandra Rodriguez, in the audience. And so thank you very much for being with us and look forward to talking with you after this meeting. Uh, Okay, so the next item is a discussion and vote on the fiscal year 2019 program planning. For fiscal year 2019, we already have two projects that we are moving forward with a briefing scheduled in November on federal civil rights enforcement efficacy and our already approved project on the condition of confinement for women. I understand from our general counsel that the second project uh, paper has sufficiently changed that the commission needs to approve the current proposed description. Uh, so Commissioner Cladney circulated the revised proposal for the Women in Prison Project. We'll discuss that now, and uh, to begin that discussion, is there a motion? Uh, so. Yes, Madam Chair, Dave Cladney here. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the amended uh, version of Women in Prison Project. Um, uh, it, it initially was a statutory enforcement report and then got moved off had to become a regular briefing report and as a result we were able to uh, expand uh, the research on the project and we clarified the uh, basis uh, of our investigation and uh, and expanded that somewhat and we added sections on uh, parental rights and disparities in education and vocational uh, programming as well so i believe everybody had the, uh, sufficient time to uh, to review it, and uh, I haven't heard any objections to it, so I would move its approval. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cladney, I, I thank you uh, for your leadership in taking over this project, which was first proposed before I joined the commission, and uh, I uh, heard commensurate with your motion, a, a description of a bit of the work that you're doing. Is there a further introduction that you want to give to us as we begin the discussion? Well, we've... Uh, We've, we've met uh, uh, quite a, with quite a few people uh, regarding uh, this subject, and initially we were focusing more on the, uh, the uh, federal uh, places of incarceration for women, and, and we've expanded uh, somewhat to the states as well. Uh, it's a, a subject that uh, really hasn't uh, taken uh, up much of uh, America's time yet. However, uh, the largest growing prison population today uh, is women. And uh, as we've looked into it, we've seen that uh, vocationally uh, they're not getting the education they need, as well as being placed far distances uh, from their families and uh, having uh, difficult times holding on to their children uh, as a result of being able not being able to defend themselves in court. Uh, if there's a termination procedures and things like that, it, it's quite an extensive uh, problem that that really no one has really looked at. So I'm I'm quite excited uh, for the commission to uh, to take uh, uh, an initial look. Thank you. Is there further discussion on this motion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. Take a roll call vote. Commissioner Degbele, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Harriet. I abstain. Commissioner Kersnow? Abstain. Commissioner Cladney? Yes. Commissioner Narasaki? Yes. Commissioner Yaki? Aye. Vice Chair Timmons Goodson? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. No commissioner opposed. Two commissioners abstained. All others were in favor. Uh, to move forward with the fiscal year 19 program planning, I understand from the staff director that we currently have capacity, financial, and otherwise to take on one additional project. I open the floor now for motions on uh, projects for consideration. Commissioner Degway, I, I know you moved earlier. Now's your time. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, open the floor for a discussion and vote on a proposed topic that um, purports to examine the EEOC's work and the federal government's response to claims of sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, we have put together a concept paper that has had the benefit of some input from commissioners who advised that they thought that it could be strengthened in particular ways. 
we've made efforts um, to tackle this very broad topic in a way that is achievable for OCRE based on current resources. The topic is so big that there are um, pieces of this that one might bite off and not be able to do it um, in an adequate amount of time. And so we've tried to scale it in a way that could make a contribution at this time where this very important issue about equality, human dignity, and the opportunity to um, work free of discrimination um, for people and women in our workplaces is a national um, story that is receiving uh, the attention that it has long deserved. <laughs> and so I would like to open the floor for discussion about the um, concept paper that we have shared with all of the commissioners and um, have that discussion followed by a vote. Thank you. Is there a Point second? of order, Madam Chair. Yes. Commissioner Yaki. Um, I'm a little confused about how we're going to be dealing with this. Are we just going to be, if we only have one availability on the runway, are we just going to discuss one if they vote and we're not going to discuss the others? Or are we going to be able to have to have presentations by the authors of the other people who have also put things on the table? So at least there is discussion amongst the commission of all the different topics that are up there. Or are we just going to go and, and vote this one through and that's going to be the end of it? Uh, my plan is to do an up or down vote on uh, each project so moved. And right now there's a motion and not yet a second on uh, Commissioner Degblay's paper. Uh, but, but, but point of order, Madam Chair, what I don't understand, you said that there is availability for one additional project. So if this project were to get a vote of yes, there would be no reason to discuss the other projects. And I think that there is a reason that everyone should be allowed to know what other projects had been had been proposed by the commissioners, so that they so not just other commissioners, but the public as well. So under your under your system, there would be no there would be no reason to bring up any other topics if this topic were to be discussed first and voted upon, because then the one slot has been filled. Commissioner Yaki, I. I uh I don't object to moving to discuss another project following a vote on this one. I also don't object to uh, discussing the projects before voting on this one. At the moment, we have a motion to uh, discuss this project, and it is not yet second. So there is no vote pending on that project. I, I hear well, you. Well, I would like to. I would like. I, I, then I would like to move a substitute motion that other commissioners with other projects should be allowed to bring them up as well. And then at the end, the conclusion of those, we may discuss and then vote upon which project shall be shall be chosen. Thank you. Is there a second for either of the motions now pending? I second uh, Commissioner Yaki's motion, a substitute motion. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Yaki, would you like to proceed with uh, an additional uh, paper to discuss? Well, I'm just, I would just like to say that I think that, that everyone who had one has the right to discuss it. And I believe that Commissioner Adegbele was, it was just giving the uh, layout for his discussion. And I would say that he should be allowed to finish. And then in turn, commissioners who have concept papers would then be allowed to go, out, go, in, go in turn. So I would allow Commissioner Adegbele to go first. Uh, and then, yeah, I don't mind going second. Perhaps Commissioner <laughs> Tim Goodson might want to go next, or whoever else has a paper that they'd like to put put up for discussion. Thank you for the consideration uh, and collegiality, Chair. Madam Vice Chair. Um, that, yes, um, Madam Chair, I am withdrawing um, the uh, paper that uh, I put forward. I'll not be proceeding uh, with that. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. At this time. Thank you. I too withdraw the paper that uh, that I had proposed, uh, so I don't plan to discuss that at this time. Uh, Commissioner Degway, uh, Commissioner Yaki invited further discussion of your paper if you'd like. I, I uh, have nothing further at this point unless there's a particular question and would yield to Commissioner Yaki to um, set out his um, concept paper. Thank you. Commissioner Yaki, would you like to proceed? Sure, thank you very much. Um, 
colleagues and members of the public. Um, I actually sent out a revised version of this uh, earlier this week. I don't know if you have it or not, but just just for the for the general edification of those who are present, uh, this concept paper uh, I think is extremely uh, and unfortunately timely. It deals with the uh, response of the federal government, uh, in particular the Federal Emergency Management Agency, with regard to uh, Hurricane Maria uh, and its impact to the peoples of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And the concept paper, as you as I as I've laid out, um, it's interesting. We went through various different iterations. I finally sort of came back to a modified version of my original because. In order to fully understand, uh, I believe, the civil rights implications of of the federal government response to uh, Hurricane Maria, one has to uh, expand it to in order to compare uh, how the federal government responded to, for example, Hurricane Harvey um, and its devastating impact on the Houston area and what it what it did. Um, or what it did not do with Hurricane Maria. Uh, there are many there are many reports of uh, the same. It's interesting. The same FEMA regional office serves both Texas and Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, there were widespread reports of lack of uh, language access, cultural cultural competency, but more than that. Uh, there, there seems to be a wide disparity in just the amount of allocation of resources uh, and recovery uh, dollars to for for the peoples of Puerto Rico and the USVI as compared to the victims of Hurricane Hurricane uh, Harvey. Uh, this does not diminish the at all uh, the devastation and the harm and the personal loss that occurred to the people in. in in the Houston, Texas area, but it does uh, beg the question of the extraordinary uh, loss of life uh, and uh, the infrastructure uh, problems that accompany the recovery uh, from Hurricane Maria, even to this day, a year later, as another hurricane right now is uh, knocking on the door of one of our one of our own commissioners. So uh, I think that. I have, in in keeping with concerns about the budget uh, for the commission, uh, I think that the importance of this is that it has never really been examined before by this commission, the idea that there can be a disparate response and allocation in times of national emergency based on national origin, uh, language, uh, or ethnicity. I think it's something that, given the fact that this seems to be occurring more and more, whether you attribute it to climate change or just bad luck. Uh, these storms seem to be occur having greater intensity and greater damage as they hit um, the parts of parts of our parts of our nation. Uh, and because and because of the lack um, of any investigated by any other body uh, of this government, uh, it feels timely and appropriate and almost necessary for this commission using its jurisdiction to be able to step in and and ask the questions and have testimony to do it. Now, as I said, recognizing the uh, limitations um, of our of our budget, I would not propose, I'm not proposing that this be a full briefing report. Uh, instead, I think that as I, as I have, as a uh, I've said to some of the other commissioners, uh, one thing that I've, I've thought that can be useful and, and should be useful is our ability to shed light on the subject, our ability to bring uh, clarity and heat and, and create a record for others to review. And sometimes that does not need to be in the form of a, of a full report. And I think that a, a good detailed hearing um, and a record uh, in and of itself can be sufficient to transmit to the public and to the Congress and the executive branch 
mm-hmm. uh, so they can read the testimony and see the record and understand the, the concerns that were brought forward uh, by the panelists and the questions put forth by commissioners in order to have that have an impact on policy in the government. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, why uh, I want to do this uh, hearing and why I think it's timely at this time um, to do it in FY19 and not push it back to FY20. Uh, I've scaled it back. I've cut it down. And uh, I appreciate your uh, consideration of it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Yaki. Anyone else have uh, proposals to discuss or discussion of either of these two proposals? Commissioner Narasaki? Uh, I don't have a proposal to discuss, uh, but I have been very torn uh, between these two concept papers. Uh, I am very distressed by the FEMA response to Puerto Rico. Uh, I, it's distressing to me because when Katrina hit Louisiana, I spent a lot of time on the language access issues where I was told by FEMA that uh, providing a 1-800 help number in Vietnamese would be giving special benefits to the Vietnamese community who could not use an English line uh, because they would be allowed to speak Vietnamese, which I just found incredibly ridiculous. Um, so it's distressing to me to find that FEMA is still not able to respond appropriately, particularly in a language like Spanish, uh, which is certainly easier to access than some of the Asian languages. Um, I think my challenge on this one is twofold. One is uh, there have been a lot of media coverage both on uh, on Maria and on Harvey and it appears that there's also potentially disparate responses in Harvey uh, for minority neighborhoods, particularly poor African American neighborhoods in Texas. So it's difficult to really, I think, compare the two and the kind of work that we would want, I would want to be able to see us do. I'm not sure that we have the capacity to do. And secondly, uh, if we are going to dig in, while I agree very much with Commissioner Yaki that one of our roles is to shine a light on these issues, um, I think it's hard to do a lot of work and not then be able to make some recommendations. Uh, I do appreciate that Commissioner Adegbele has adjusted his paper so that it does not just focus on EOC, who as a commission like ours has been starved for resources for many, many years, even though they've been, uh, have had an expanding jurisdiction. Uh, uh, to actually look at what is going on in at least a couple of the agencies because I believe that some of the uh, Title IX issues begins with the agency efforts uh, and the degree to which they are functioning well and treating seriously the complaints that are being raised by their employees. Uh, so I lay that out. Uh, and note that I will be supporting uh, Commissioner Adegbele's concept paper, but I hope that uh, when Congress looks at our budget, which I believe unfortunately will not be until after the midterm election, that if we get a sufficient increase in our budget that we would consider uh, adding uh, uh, a look at the situation with FEMA at a later time. Thank you. Commissioner Harriet. I just want to say that I think both these proposals um, are, are interesting and worthy. Um, I'm sad we can only do one of them, and as I agree with, with Commissioner Narasaki that if we get more resources, it would be nice to do both. Uh, I think it's important not to prejudge these issues, um, and in that regard, um, I had dinner last night with a with an attorney uh, from the Department of Homeland Security, um, and he reported an anecdote um, that I think is apropos here. He was actually wearing a a, a Department of Homeland Security um, T-shirt um, while traveling, um, not in the last few weeks, but maybe you know a year year ago, maybe less than a year ago. Um, and someone came up to him and demanded to know, do you work for the Department of Homeland Security? Um, and he was a little taken aback, yes. And the guy said, 
The work you guys did in Puerto Rico for Hurricane Maria was great. Just absolutely fabulous. Um, and so somebody um, thinks they did a good job. Um, so as I say, we must withhold um, judgment on that issue. Thank you. Any further discussion? These proposals or another proposal? Uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Chair. Yes. Um, I was just going to say that uh, this uh, issue highlights uh, the challenge that our agency has been uh, facing for some time. And um, that one deals with difficult choices, um, mm -hmm. having the desire, uh, even the, the will to perform our duty uh, as set out by statute, but yet uh, not having uh, the resources um, to make it happen. And so I do agree that both of the proposals are worthy, and um, I hope that we'll be able to um, at some point do both. Um, but at this time, I would be supporting uh, Commissioner Adekale and um, point out that I don't believe that anyone, any agency, uh, is investigating or, or doing anything with the sexual harassment, um, but there are uh, efforts um, underway that uh, are looking into what's going on uh, where FEMA is concerned, and so I'll be supporting um, Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you. Further discussion from folks on the phone or in the room? I'll offer, I, I too share the view that these are uh, very, very compelling proposals. I, I will say that I am uh, also compelled by the proposal I withdrew, and I was compelled by the proposal that the vice chair withdrew. So I think we have had a, a menu of uh, very important civil rights options that uh, we've been thinking about, and uh, and it is very challenging to have to, to limit ourselves to uh, uh, what is within capacity for us to do, uh, and also um, challenging to, to turn away from issues that are so important to uh, our fellow Americans and also to us in this room. Out of uh, respect for the seriousness of the issues related to uh, catastrophe responses and uh, hearing from uh, the views of fellow commissioners today, I would move to table that motion for a time when our resources are more certain, uh, when we might be able to uh, have a fuller discussion with the staff director about capacity to address the issue and, uh, and perhaps to take up some of the issues that other commissioners have raised. I offer that um, uh, for Commissioner Yaki's consideration. And hearing no interest, I invite uh, either. I was on mute. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, I was on. I was on mute. So welcome to off a, mute. Give me a second. <laughs> yeah, well, make sure there's any background noise going on. Um, uh, if you would like to uh, table the motion. Commissioner Yaki, we, I, I heard you say if you would like to table the motion, and then I didn't hear what you said after that. I'm sorry, what? I heard you say if you would like to table the motion, and then did not hear what you said after that. I said if you would like to table the motion, I would not object. Ah, thank you. Okay. So then we can proceed with uh, Commissioner Degbele has moved uh, for consideration mm -hmm. of his proposal. That motion has not yet been seconded. Is there a second? I second. I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, I'll proceed with a uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Degbele, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Harriet? I'm utterly confused now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I take it a, a vote of no would be a vote for um, Commissioner Yaki's project? Uh, no, this is an up or down vote on Commissioner uh, so when, 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 Michael tabled his motion. Yeah, but that does that mean he's tabled his desire to have that his his project be picked? Um, or does it mean just procedurally he's happy to have it done in the form of a vote on Commissioner Adegbele's program? Commissioner Yaki, do you want to speak to, to your feelings on that? Um, why don't we just make it, make it easier? Uh, at this point, I withdraw my motion um, to have this for consideration. And if there's no objection, I can, that, can, that can just be it. Thank you. 
So, so now we'll proceed with an up or down vote on Commissioner Degley's. And it's the only only proposal that is 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 um, being considered at this point. It is okay. Then I'm for it. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes that's the only way one can win. <laughs> You'll take them when you find them, right, <laughs> Commissioner Chris? Now. Abstain. Commissioner Cladney. Yes. Commissioner Narasaki. Yes. Commissioner Yaki. Aye. Thank you. Vice Chair Timmons Goodson. Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. One commissioner abstained. No commissioner opposed. All others were in favor. Uh, the next item is a discussion and vote on our fiscal year 2020, uh, 2020 program planning for the statutory enforcement report. For fiscal year 2020, we'll continue what we began last year, Commissioner Harriet's suggestion, which is approving a statutory enforcement report uh, project two years in advance to allow commission staff time for planning and other necessary work in advance. I'll open the floor for motions now on projects for consideration. Madam Chair, Cladney here. Uh, I'd like to uh, move to approve my project on subminimum wage. Uh, I believe it's important uh, that we look into this disability issue. Uh, we haven't, the last disability issue we've really done as a pure disability issue, I think, was the busing of um, the mentally disabled people from state to state. Uh, we believe that this. Uh, this is an important issue. It's highly technical and it hasn't received a lot of attention. Um, it's one of the only statutes that's explicitly uh, discriminatory on the basis of disability. And it's important to look in to see just not how uh, only how the program's functioning, but how it's being overseen and how it's being governed and how people are uh, using the program and how people with disabilities are or aren't benefiting from it. Uh, there have been reports of wages of below a dollar, um, and I think that uh, it would be right uh, a right time for the commission to uh, look at a subject like this, especially when it comes to uh, uh, these kinds of disabilities. Thank you, Commissioner Cladney. Is there a second for that motion? I second. Thank you. Uh, is there any any other discussion of the motion? Commissioner Narasaki? I very much strongly support uh, this as a this topic as a hearing. Uh, I think, however well intentioned the existing law might be, uh, there has been a lot of evolution on the issue of uh, mental uh, and other disabilities, and it's time to examine whether, in fact, this law is fair and whether it is, in fact, working as intended or can be improved uh, or, uh, or removed. So I am open-minded on the topic, but I think it's a very important topic to look at. Thank you. I will say that uh, in, in my last life, when I was Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the Department of Education, I uh, worked with the Department of Justice a bit on an investigation mentioned in your concept paper, Commissioner Cladney, about the uh, Rhode Island uh, settlement for uh, students with disabilities who were in segregated settings and uh, not, not being prepared effectively for uh, workplace. Those were among the more harrowing facts that uh, I investigated and that I, I knew about in that time, and uh, I would I would welcome our investigation of progress with respect to uh, that settlement and and also um, the degree to which those conditions proliferate in other places. And so I uh, I appreciate your suggestion that we take on a disability focused topic generally, and that we take on this specific topic, which I, I find very compelling. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further discussion on uh, this topic? Hearing none, I'll call the question take a roll call vote. Commissioner Degley, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Harriet? We don't get any other choices on this one either. <laughs> I, I invited <laughs> motions and, and heard none. Okay. <laughs> then like, Russian yes. elections. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's very dark for today. <laughs> I'm willing to go with this one. So, okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Kirsten. 
Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Kladney? Yes. Commissioner Narasaki? Yes. Commissioner Yaki? Aye. Thank you. Vice Chair Timmons Goodson? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, so now we will move to our amended agenda item, a discussion and vote on an administrative instruction regarding denoting commissioner abstention and recusal on commission reports. Is there a motion to open the floor for discussion? So moved. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll second that. <laughs> Uh, and Madam Vice Chair, I appreciate your seconding uh, uh, Commissioner Dagway's motion for approval of a uh, uh, proposal I believe you've sponsored, uh, Madam Vice Chair. So would you like to yeah. begin our discussion? Yes, uh, specifically, um, I'm asking, or the motion is asking that we adopt the um, following administrative instruction to be placed in um, administrative um, instruction. 6.06, it reads as follows, I believe each of you have a copy, quote, commissioners who are financially recused from working on the topic of a report should notify the designated agency ethics officer and should not participate in any portion of the project. The staff director will denote recusal in the written report by, number one, placing an asterisk beside the recused commission uh, name when listing members of the commission and two placing text at the bottom of the page explaining that the asterisk denotes recusal. Commissioners wishing to abstain should notify the staff director during the vote approving the report. The staff director will denote abstention in the written report by one, placing a carrot beside the abstained commissioner's name when listing members of the commission and two placing text at the bottom of the page explaining that the carrot denotes uh, abstention, uh, end of quote. Um, as you're probably aware, um, currently the report only lists the commissioners uh, but doesn't indicate whether any commissioner abstained or uh, was recused from voting. Um, I had a concern uh, that the reports did not provide such information when last year uh, in um, another vein, I was seeking I was seeking to answer questions regarding my uh, opinions and uh, views on issues and prior statements on issues. And I it came to my attention then that while I had con register a recusal or an abstention um, there was not indicated anywhere and it was reasonable for one to assume that I uh, was in support of the um, the report or the statement and so I thought it might be a good idea for us to consider whether we wanted to in some way make it clear um, how commissioners stood on uh, reports and things. And so that's the, the genesis of, uh, of this. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Any other discussion on this motion, Commissioner Harris? I just want to seek a, a clarification for the record mainly. Um, my understanding of, of this is that we are going to be voting solely on adding um, this section on recusal. Um, we were given um, paper that that, ha that restates some of the other uh, adjacent sections. And I just want a, a clarification that this is only intended to add that section and it will have no effect on our current practices for commissioner statements, rebuttals, and sir rebuttals. So Madam um, Vice Chair. This, yes, my understanding uh, and my intention was simply to deal with this issue um, of recusals and um, abstentions. What we, uh, I did um, following um, Cheryl Cozart's work uh, with me on this, we uh, sent the matter to our um, general counsel uh, for her to, to look at it. And um, 
she made some suggestions and we incorporated those and she added that uh, while this is not what um, you asked about this is what I have found in my research that uh, dealing with uh, the matter that you just raised Commissioner Harriet and she said you could um, if you wanted consider um, you know placing this um, and I indicated that you know I only took this up and that's as far as I wanted to go so uh, my motion today is simply to adopt the language that, that I've read and you know at a later time we can do you know, whatever it is that uh, Commissioner Harriet is uh, proposing thank you and, and I, I will just I have a question uh, I'm sorry just uh, one moment I'm sorry Commissioner Yock, I'll just confirm that, that I share the view that all, all we're doing with this is, is adding this text and not modifying any of our existing practice but Commissioner Yaki do you want to go ahead I was just wondering if I'm working on a brief involving the abstention doctrine do I have to abstain from this <laughs> no you're confusing <laughs> us <laughs> but thank you <laughs> and good luck with the brief so uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll call the question. Take a roll call vote. Commissioner Degbelay, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Harriet? Yes. Commissioner Kersnow? Yes. Commissioner Cladney? Yes. Commissioner Arsaki? Yes. Commissioner Yaki? I really want to abstain, but I'll say aye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Vice Chair Timmons Goodson? Yes. And I vote yes, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, next, we'll hear from Staff Director Mara Morales for the monthly Staff Director's Report. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> In the interest of brevity, um, getting the um, commission meeting uh, to its end, uh, I'm always available to discuss any particular issue contained in the report with the commissioner or commissioners. So with that, uh, I thank you. And I, I really want to just do a shout out to all our staff and the hard work and special assistance and all of the commissioners uh, in getting our uh, statutory enforcement report out this week. Um, outstanding team effort and I want to acknowledge um, there's so many people that have played an important uh, role in this. Um, I want to make sure that we uh, you know, include everybody but if I, I know if I do I'll, I'll leave people out but um, I, Madam Chair, I also appreciate your leadership in helping us and all the commissioners in getting us uh, over the finish line. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. I, I echo those thanks. This was uh, an exciting week to see our, our uh, annual statutory report out and published. And uh, I will also note that we are coming within weeks of the end of our fiscal year. So I know that our staff are working intensely hard to close our books and um, bring us to the close of this fiscal year. So I thank all the staff for their work on that effort as well, and I look forward to the coming fiscal year. So uh, nothing further, I hereby adjourn our meeting at 11.49 a.m. Eastern Time. Thank you.